Hi, welcome to the Small Festival Book Club and here's my presentation on Red Pill. On the book's sleeve, it tells us more than anything that this is a book about love, which came as a bit of a surprise to me actually, because surely this is also a book about ideas and it's the ideas that I'm going to focus on. He explores the idea of the self, he talks about the development of a surveillance society and he asks really interesting questions like what would it be like to kneel before an executioner at the mercy of people who hate me? And what if, in one of the many references to the Matrix, we are nothing more than code? So this is a book full of philosophy and full of philosophical voices, including Heraclitus and Cicero, Hegel and Kant and Schopenhauer and Sartre and Foucault. And those are just the ones who have been directly referenced. The idea of the self is there at the very beginning. It's in his thesis, the lyric eye, described as a container in which selfhood has come to be formulated. And I think it's fair enough to say that our narrator is pretty fixated about the self and pretty fixated about his own self. And throughout the book, he yo-yos back and forth with arguments about the existence or the non-existence of the self. Surveillance is another huge theme. He works in a glass cube in the Deuter Center, built on the ideal of transparency, and which pushes under the doors of its guests, uh, slips, setting out the time spent in the workspace, in the communal meals, and in public lectures. There are cameras poked over hedges and surveillance feeds watching unwitting guests, including Edgar with his folded white belly and little cone of a penis, all of which adds irony to his particular attack on privacy as a right to lie and to conceal our secrets in the grubby hiding place of our soul. So our narrator is full of anxiety about technology and the power of surveillance. He talks about Jeremy Bentham's prison design, the all-seeing panopticon where all prisoners can be seen all of the time. Um, he talks about Sartre's peeping Tom, caught looking through the keyhole, transforming him from a kind of pure and free consciousness to one now imprisoned under an external gaze. And there's a whole chapter devoted to Monica's story where old men reeking of piss, schnapps and cabbage use a surveillance state pretty much to destroy it really. But more than anything, I think the main theme is one of confrontation. Confrontation between Anton and our narrator. And of course, this is not Anton or our narrator, just um, pictorial representations. And I do apologize particularly to Hari for uh, using his image in this way. But it's a confrontation, and it's a confrontation between these individuals, but it's more than that. It's also a confrontation between liberalism and its claims for universal human rights and its enemies. And I think it's this confrontation which is at the heart of the book and the driving theme of the story. So I want to explore this confrontation in four ways. I want to introduce our protagonists, I want to set out what is old and what is new in this argument. I want to consider how the confrontation unfolds. And I want to ask who or what is the red pill? So beginning with the protagonists and starting with the enemies of liberalism, well of course we have Edgar, who in some senses represents the ideas of evolutionary biology and neuroscience, but really Edgar is just the hors d'oeuvre for the real enemy, who of course is Anton. And I think we can think about Anton in three different ways. Firstly, he's the voice of three centuries of anti-liberal philosophy, channeling the philosophy of these guys down here, Hobbes, Machiavelli, Nietzsche and Carl Schmitt. But he's also writing in the apocalyptic style of the deeply cynical 17th century thinker Joseph Comte de Maistre, whose style is all degradation, butchery and protestation before God. A second way to think about Anton is as a champion of culture-based violence 
delivered in the fast and bloody images of blue lives, with each scene harder to watch, making the victim's terror become our terror as when Carson, face splattered with blood and looking directly into the camera, tells us that the whole earth is perpetually steeped in blood and is nothing but a vast altar on which all living things must be sacrificed without end, without restraint, without pause, until the consummation of things. And finally, there's a third way um, of thinking about Anton as an icon of cool fascism. An image brilliantly realised in the Paris film on inspiration where we see him a composite of hiking, chopping, yoga, swinging a real axe at a real actor, overlooking a northern sea, the shore, the mountain, in a ruined church, part called fascist, part cyber elite, part warlord capitalist. To camera he says, I am Cortez, I have sailed over the horizon and returned with wealth and power beyond your dreams. Okay, that's the enemies of liberalism. Who's going to represent liberalism? Well, of course, we know who's going to represent liberalism. It's going to be our narrator. And like Anton, I think we can think about our narrator in three different ways. The first is that he's the voice of liberalism. He wanted to say, he tells us, that human beings should always be treated as ends rather than means, and that we have rights by the virtue of our agency. Well, these are pretty much the words of Immanuel Kant, who pretty much invented the idea of human rights, and that's what's at stake for our narrator. A second way you can think about him is as a liberal Cassandra. Now, um, Cassandra was the priestess in Greek myth who was cursed to utter true and terrible prophecies, but never to be believed. And like Cassandra, our narrator wants to warn Ray and through her warn us, or at least those of us who retain faith in democracy and what our narrator called the essential reasonableness of the world. Have you been online lately? This is what Weimar Germany must have felt like. I mean, ask yourself honestly, what would happen to people like us, people they hate, if they came to power? And as part of this role, he has two very dark prophecies. The first is a descent into fascism. He sees the breaking down of moral certainties between what is right and what is unthinkable, like the image of a child being brutally murdered as a form of entertainment. And everywhere there is the rising rule of global gangsterism. And now he sees Anton telling potentially millions that democracy ought to be abandoned for something more muscular. The second prophecy is even darker and is nothing less than the end of all human life, which he sets out in his apocalypse, which he's writing feverishly and crazily away whilst he's waiting for Anton. And this is an apocalypse of plagues and melting glaciers and drowned cities and millions on the move the blotting out of the sun, mystery reduced to algorithm, and human values swept away by cruel tribalism, the art of the deal, and raw power. And finally, he's a liberal defender, firstly in the war of words. And although Anton normally and always gets the better of him, occasionally has a few good comebacks. The meat grinder, that's it, that's all there is. That's a disgusting vision. And secondly, as a kind of armed warrior, ready with his vicious camping knife for his final confrontation. So that's the protagonists. What about what's old and what's new? Well, what's old are the arguments. 300 years of anti-liberalism attacking its utopian conception of human nature, its naivety in the face of power, its worship of humanity, its deification of reason, and its decadent and artificial civilization. The new, well, that's big tech, AI, algorithms, and social media, what I'm going to call the capitalist data complex. In 1950, President Eisenhower coined the phrase the military-industrial complex, and that was very much taken up by social scientists at the time. 
And I think that today there is a new complex or a new matrix of power based on the interplay between these forces. All of which is brilliantly set out by this man here, Noah Harari, in his wonderful book, Hamadeus, which I talked about uh, a couple of years back, and in which he argues that the liberal package of the self, human rights and democracy, is being undermined by these forces. And we're in danger of moving to a new kind of data capitalism run by a super elite of upgraded humans presiding over a useless mass of people, which I think is a neat summation of Anton's ambition and pretty much the territory of his mind. In terms of how the confrontation unfolds, well, I think there are two phases. There's Anton's attack, and there's also our narrator's fall, disappearing into a kind of madness. Anton's attack is a full frontal, intellectual, cultural, and psychological attack on the narrator. And, and of course, therefore, on liberalism. It is strident and confident and aggressive and opportunistic. And I also think it's really intelligent and creative. I mean, throughout, he mocks liberal intelligence, attacking liberalism on its home ground, really, the domain of intelligence and knowledge, qualities which uh, liberals want to claim for themselves. Here's all you need to know about your situation, he tells our narrator. I am several steps ahead of you. I will always be several steps ahead of you. Why? Because I'm smarter and I know how the world works and I'm not a loser or a fuck up and you are broken and naive and I'm so far into your head, it's almost comical. And alongside this ridicule is a claim to higher knowledge, untainted by liberal fairy stories, where true wisdom uh, arises out of primordial fear and the sheer majesty of power. Carson, Anton tells us, starts off as just another schmuck, but he learns the truth about the world after he's initiated into the mystery of power. And even our narrator succumbs to this alternative reality as he waits for his final showdown, telling us that the truth of existence, it lay in a sort of ceaseless and impersonal violence. And behind all of this is a sense of threat and an atmosphere of menace. Coming across Anton's review of his book, our narrator reads, the author is not self-aware enough to know how afraid he ought to be. But of course, as we all know, uh, in reality, he's um, terrified. And beneath this attack are three arguments of anti-liberal political philosophy. The first is about the nature of power, where Anton, channeling Hobbes and Machiavelli, argues that concentrated and absolute power is both necessary and moral, and that action and power and violence are the foundation of the state and the essence of politics. And what you call politics, he says to our narrator, is just squeamishness and your morality just paralysis. The second argument is the idea of tribe as the foundation of politics, that tribe is the basis of loyalty and of rights and the nature of politics itself, and that tribe stands both higher than the individual and in opposition to other tribes which is essentially, as our narrator calls it, plain old-fashioned racism, or later on, uh, cruel tribalism. And the philosophical justification for this is this man here, Carl Schmidt, whose concept of the political was both a book and an idea, was founded on the distinction between friend and enemy. I'm a racist because I want to be with my own kind, and you're a saint because you have a sentimental wish to help other people far away. Nice, abstract refugees who save you from having to commit to anybody or anything real. And finally, there is the elite over the herd. The future, Anton tells us, belongs to those who separate themselves out from the herd. In 50 years, most human beings, he tells us, will be surplus, just raw material for the elite and we won't owe these people the same moral obligations. They are there essentially to do our bidding. 
And although eventually we might be able to build such servants ourselves, in the medium term we must use the ones we have, the ones over whom we hold domination. So that's Anton's attack. And in the face of this attack, our narrator begins his fall. He's simply not prepared for all of this and was already fearful before he met Anton, full of dark premonitions and hunched over his laptop, crying over war videos. And so he begins a journey into disorder, madness and potentially death. His room begins to smell, variously dotted with spatters of sauce, empty coffee cups, beer cans and underwear. And retreating into his laptop, he begins to fall through the trap door of blood, violence and screaming that is blue lives. If Carson's children died, he tells us, he might fall into a new level of hell. And blue lives felt threatening, threatening to me personally, to who I was, to the people I loved. And when our narrator leaves the safety of his room and into Berlin and his encounter with Anton, this is a city seeking to absorb three million Syrians offered refuge. With undertones of political violence and scenes of desperate need, all of which I think were really well crystallised in those three encounters with the refugee father and his daughter. The first of which sees his father climbing out of a dumpster to feed his daughter from the trash. And from Berlin he'll journey to Paris and the Scottish island, which really begins a kind of journey towards death and with violence circling ever closer. And despite his dislike of the man, he comes more and more to resemble Christ who of course was on his own self-obsessed journey to death. And so there's no doubt as to who's going to win this confrontation. As our narrator's fall makes clear, this is not a struggle of equals. Our narrator is weak and falling into madness and Anton is well resourced, skilled and powerful. And ultimately it's our narrator who comes to doubt what he believes in, asking Ray, why do we even believe in human rights? I and mean, what is it that makes us so special? And finally, who or what is the red pill? Well, as I'm sure most of you know, this is from The Matrix. And the red pill is this idea, it is somehow a kind of portal to true reality, a kind of illusion stripper to bear an unforgiving reality. And I think there are many candidates for the red pill in this book and I think different people will um, make different choices about that. I mean clearly Anton thinks he's the man dishing out red pill reality. After all, he is the Magus of the North who has opened the Book of Secrets. At the Turkish restaurant he tells our narrator, come inside or stay in the dark. Um, as if, our narrator tells us, he were about to initiate me into a mystery and offer me the red pill. But for me, it's our narrator who is the best candidate uh, for the red pill. Though at first sight I know this seems implausible. He is, after all, pretty self-obsessed, falling into madness. And we see his limitations throughout the novel, the frustration and the anxiety he causes Ray, the contempt he inspires, not simply in Anton, but also in Monica, and the fear that he creates in the Syrian father attempting to foist unwanted and misunderstood gifts upon him. And even his therapist entreats him, stop asking for life to be a poem. But despite all of this, he turns out to be right, or at least partially right. I mean, by the book's conclusion, our narrator's fear, which has been dismissed by his therapist and for which he has been pitied, ignored and incarcerated, moves with the election of Donald Trump from his psyche into the world. My madness, he tells us, the madness for which I'd been medicated, therapized and detained was about to become everybody's madness. And I think it's appropriate that the representative of liberalism is flawed because liberalism is flawed. Though I don't think this book is so much about the flaws of liberalism as it is about the power of internet-enabled far-right activism now maxing out on the possibilities of the capitalist data complex. And for me, this is the red pill vision 
administered in this book. I want to conclude now by looking at two particular strengths of this book. Firstly, its realism, and secondly, its ending. Looking at the first of these, for all its intellectualism, I thought this book had a visceral quality, and the picture it painted I felt to be very real, particularly its portrait of the power and the possibilities of the alt-right world, which I found plausible and believable, and something that the book made me feel. I felt the power of Anton's film. I felt like I was watching a documentary when he took us down the alt-right internet rabbit holes. Marvelling at the invention of what he came to call the Starnberg content, a bewildering cavalcade of self-inseminating blogs, sites and forums, co-posting each other into existence, including flat earther tracks, archives of 1980s body modification pictures, occult tracks, Nazi polar mysticism and scientific papers documenting Chinese experiments in human embryo selection. And as well as this incredible living detail, the larger picture was equally alive, making me see what I hadn't seen before, which was how creatively and effectively far-right activists are using the potential and the power of social media. And finally, turning to the book's ending, I think it's a book that ends well emotionally and politically. Emotionally, we find love working to redeem and transform our narrator, so that by the end his precious individuality gives way to being held in a web of reciprocity. A long way from his pompous thesis, the lyric eye, as the container in which modern selfhood would be formulated. And with the last words of the book, we see him dissolved into a warm and safe embrace of family, which of course is an embrace of love. And I also think the book ends well politically. This does not mean, of course, that it has a happy ending and its final scene is anything but. But I do think it works to reanimate the driving themes of the story. It concludes on November the 8th, 2016, a day in which our narrator saw Edgar's new book on sale, The Authoritarian Left and the New Religion of Social Justice, and later at Ray's party, he hears a guest declare interest in Anton's new show, The Spear of Destiny. And then he goes on to watch his wife and friends crushed by Trump's victory. And finally, returning to the internet for the first time since his breakdown, he streams Trump's victory party and there at the back, phone pressed to his ear, is a smiling Anton. And later he strolls back to the Starnberg posts, now a frenzy of memes and exaltation, and one of them stands out, portraying an animated spear rising in front of an icy landscape and the caption, a new power arises in the north. So by the end, our narrator has had credibility restored, something that I think is painfully recognised by Ray, who has become, with him now becoming the realist and her the utopian. And I also think it gives back credibility to his warning, to those who believe in the reasonableness of the world, that human values might be swept away by cruel tribalism, the art of the deal and the raw exercise of power.